thank you to the organizers for inviting me and thank you for you to coming to a lecture of a philosopher, which is not very usual, but I will try to be as close to physics as possible. The basic idea behind uh, instrumental realism is the idea that actually our knowledge is not very often or in very many areas somehow mitigated by instruments. So we, have, we don't have direct access to many facts, but we somehow get them by means of instruments. The original motivation for this approach was in philosophy of mathematics, because the idea was that actually also mathematics gives us new knowledge, and we gain the new knowledge by some symbolic tools like algebraic equations or geometric constructions, etc. So basically, the instruments play an important role also in mathematics, and so maybe this approach tries to unify philosophy of mathematics and philosophy of sciences or physics. Now, uh, it is basically an approach to philosophy of science in a broader sense, and uh, it focuses on the inst a role of instruments in acquisition of knowledge about the objective world. And so if we look on the mathematical side, so the idea is that also mathematics gives us knowledge about the objective world. So in a sense, mathematics and physics work on a par and are somehow analogous. So it's a kind of unifying approach to these two areas. That's why I try to discriminate four layers or four steps. And the first is, I call epistemic contact. It's usually called evidence, but physicists and philosophers of science are interested in sensual, sensory perception. And so how really by our senses we get knowledge of reality. But I would like to broaden this concept. So epistemic contact is not only based or related to our senses, but it can be a calculation. So anyway, how we get to contact to something which we didn't know and now we know, so somehow contact to reality, that I call epistemic contact. We will see many other examples and how it works. The next step is something which I call stabilization of the epistemic contact. It's a very important step, which, of course, many instruments are developed in order to stabilize our epistemic contact to different phenomena like color, etc. Then we, the third is the instrumental extension of epistemic contact. So basically what are instruments for are that they open us access to phenomena which we don't have contact or direct access to. And then the fourth layer, which is maybe the most important, is the explanation of idealizations, because idealizations are very often used in science, but I think that the philosophical account of idealization is not very satisfying, because people usually define idealization as a distortion. But why do physicists distort their theories? Why don't they do them as they really are? Why do we create models which are distorted models of reality? Why do we idealize? And I try to explain idealization as a means to unify instrumental practices. So basically, idealization is a, is a way how we can bring together instruments that have different precisions, different scopes, etc., and how can we unite them into a unified scientific culture. So this will be the four parts of the talk. So, of course, epistemic context, so knowledge is not limited to sensory experience. It is typical in mathematics that actually if you do a calculation, so somehow by doing it, we get some epistemic facts, something new. So the concept of epistemic context includes sensory experience, of course, the physical one, but also experiences gained by computations, modeling, so other tools, and also experience obtained by measurement. So Basically, if we get in a some kind of contact with something real, I try to analyze it and explain it as epistemic contact. Now, here is my favorite picture from Dürer, and it is from his book Unterweisung der Messung, 1525. And it is a very interesting book because I think that it is the first, or he starts the psychoanalysis because Dürer is analyzing what is he doing when he's painting. So, in a sense, he's trying to understand how perspective works. And if you 
So here in the, on the wall is a nail, and on the nail there is a rope, and on the rope there is a tube, a narrow tube, through which the painter is looking, and so he is taking a point on the vase, and now where the, the ray of light uh, cuts the foil, he puts a point and makes here a painting of the vase. So basically it's very interesting because here we can see that actually the contact is his visual contact. So he is looking and painting what he's seeing. So basically is the, is the immediate visual perception. But uh, the, the, the picture is, is constructed so that, as if it would be appear from this point of view. So basically this is the center of projection. So the perspective is constructed, constructed from a different point. So I think this is very interesting because it shows you the difference between the center or the point of view from which the perspective is constructed and the actual eye of the painter who is somehow making the construction. So this is an example of stabilization of epistemic contact. If you take a painting from the Middle Ages, so the painters, and take for instance a city, so a painting of, I don't know, Bratislava, Vienna, or Budapest, or Warsaw, or, so what you can find are buildings. But the painters want to have more, as much information as he can get, so he is turning the buildings so that you recognize them. So every building is approximately has the same size and is turned to you by its face. So the painting doesn't carry the information about the spatial relations of the buildings, about their distance. All of them are approximately of the same size and they are turned towards you by their front in order to be recognizable. So this, this way of painting, of course, changes when you invent perspective and when in the Renaissance the perspectival painting started. So the painting has much more information in it because all the orientation of the buildings, the, the distances, etc., can be reconstructed from a perspectival painting. So by stabilization of epistemic context, so basically uh, this uh, painter, actually his, his epistemic contact is all, all, always the, just the visual contact, but basically it's stabilized in a way that he is not moving, he is not changing his position, but the entire construction is done from a fixed point. And this brings on in many things into the, into the representation. Now what is very interesting in, in is that 20 years later appears a very interesting book by Copernicus, The Revol Revolutionius Orbium Celestium. And I think that it has many similarities with this etching of Dürer. So, here, what is happening here? Here is Dürer from an external position. We actually can find out where Dürer is positioned because actually, you know, if you look where the two parallel lines, this is one of the ceiling and this is other side of the ceiling, intersect it somewhere here. So in front of this point, in a distance that you can determine by the, using this square, you can determine where was Dürer standing when he painted or made this etching. So basically, he creates an external perspective on somebody painting. And what is doing Copernicus? So, you, of course, the problem with astronomy at these times was that they had observations, but each observation was done from a different position of the Earth. So the Earth was moving around the Sun, and so every observation was done from different positions. So just like the painter in the Middle Ages, you know, Everything was painted differently. And so uh, what did uh, Copernicus do? Copernicus created an external position from which he was looking on the astronomer sitting on the Earth, and he said that, okay, he is perceiving a rotating, rotating sky, but actually he is rotating, etc. etc. So the epistemic structure of Copernicus is, I think, the same as in Dürer. That means that I take an external position, and from this external position, I reconstruct the experience I get from astronomical observations. And of course, again, the Copernican system contains much more information. Why? Because just take in the Kepler's three laws, they are not valid in the heliocentric system. They are valid only in the heliocentric system. If you have a geocentric system, so of course, the planets don't move on ellipses, the sectorial velocity is not constant, etc. 
So in a sense, just like in the painting, by fixing the epistemic contact, that means by creating a stable viewpoint from which we construct the representation, we get much richer information about what's going on. So in a sense, uh, the Keplerian system, Kepler didn't have more or better. He had, of course, the, the data of Tycho de Brahe, so they were slightly better than the previous data. But the big breakthrough was not by the way that he had some new data, but that he was able to stabilize them, that he was able to distract the motion of the Earth and construct the picture as it appeared from a stable sun. Now, the discovery, discovery of Kepler's law required not only high precision observation of Tifo de Brahe, but also the stabilization using perspective of an external observer. And as we know, Kepler's law were crucial for Newton. So Newton really used Kepler's law in discovering his universal gravity, gravitation. So basically, the stabilization of epistemic uh, contact was very important, but it is not just in the 16th century, but if you take mechanics, so if you compare Newton, Lagrange, and Hamilton, and you try to describe in these three systems just the simple thing, Earth and Sun. So you have two-body problems, but the two-body problems in Newton is described as a motion of two bodies in a three-dimensional space. By Lagrange, it's a motion of one body in a six-dimensional configurational space, and by Hamilton, it's a motion of one body in or one point in 12-dimensional uh, phase space. So basically, again, uh, I think that the, the data used by Newton, Lagrange, and Hamilton have the same epistemic context. So they are visual data about observation about the position of the bodies, but still the Hamiltonian picture captures much more information. For instance, for instance the conservation of the phase volume. The conservation of phase volume is a law that is invisible in the Newtonian or Lagrangian picture, but is clearly visible in the Hamiltonian because it gives us a more stable representation of reality. So this shows that the stabilization of epistemic uh, contact is an important way how to deal with, uh, with data. And we have here, of course, Newton. And this is a very funny thing because this is, of course, some kind of modern... It's, they, they didn't have photographs at those times, so we don't, have, don't know how it looked like. But the main important thing was that many people were already playing with uh, prisons, but the, the trick of Newton was that he was projecting on the wall so some four or four meters long uh, distance, and so the, the color separated. Now, what is interesting on this thing? Actually, I could write on the wall the names of the colors. And if Newton would have a, a colorblind assistant, so somebody who never saw any color, and I ask him, what color is this piece of cloth? What can he do? He can put the, the ray of light going through the cloth and then look on the wall where the light comes. So even if he is not able to... Uh, see colors, to, uh, to perceive the quality of color, he is still able to say to his boss, to Newton, that the, the piece of cloth is red or green or whatever. So in a sense, what is Newton doing here? He is turning the perception into a physical event. So before Newton, so in Descartes, basically the analysis of knowledge was done in a way as a process that starts out there goes through the senses into our brain, and in the brain, in a pineal gland, etc., we somehow start to understand what's going on. So there the cogito really starts to know. So the process of knowledge was, a, I call it a radial process, so going from outside into my brain. Here it is turned. It goes from the left to the right. So in a sense, it happens in front of us, so it is observable by other observers. So it is not a subjective event of the observer inside of the soul of the observer, but it is an objective physical event. So this is how the stabilization of the epistemic contact goes on. So basically, it becomes a part of the world. Of course, at the end, I need somebody who is able to write down on the wall the names of the colors. But once it is done, 
it, the, the, it can be used by somebody who is colorblind, colorblind, who doesn't understand what a color is, etc., but still he is able to measure what a color is. So this is the process of stabilization of epistemic excess. So of course everybody of us know what is a color, but here, during the, thanks to this prism, etc., we got a very stable access to the differences of colors, etc. So, it's okay. And uh, so, if a Newton had a colorblind assistant and asked him if a piece of cloth is red or blue, he could find out. So, in a sense, uh, uh, the stabilization of epistemic contact consists in externalizing our experiences. So, the process at the first so. First, it was exper externalizing the position. So what uh, Dürer or Copernicus did, they ex of course, it's always me who is observing and from here where I'm standing. So in a sense, the position is subjective, is given by my position in the world. But I can make a nail, put it into the wall, and so I can externalize my position and make the observation relative to that point and not to my position. Then we can... Uh, External simultaneity. So if you consider the two-body problem, so for Newton, I am here, here is the sun, here is the earth, and they are moving. In Lagrange, I somehow put one world beside the other world, and so in a sense, I'm stabilizing the simul... So because if I understand simultaneity normally, it is simultaneous from my perspective. So here is the sun, here is the earth, and here is the emotion. So how they move relative to each other is de detected by me. But in the Lagrangian system is detected by the geometry of the space. So again, the simultaneity becomes externalized. And of course, the color differences in Newton are also becoming exter externalized. So usually they are subjective perception on the retina, but they become points on the wall. So uh, experience becomes an event in the external world. This is, I think, the the process of stabilization, how it, how it worked in the history of physics. But uh, this stabilization of epistemic contact usually has three components which are very interesting. It's a point of view, of course, relative to which I construct the representation. It's the horizon, the limits of the world represented. And then it's kind of identity relation where I can, I am able to detach detect the same object in different position or different, different places. These aspects are automatically, automatically present in measurement. So a measurement basically has all these three aspects built into it, itself. And so the point of view, of course, corresponds to zero, so zero temperature or the origin of the reference frame. So the origin of the reference frame is not, an object, not something real. It just gives a po point like the nail in the wall, on the wall in the Dürer's etching, from which we construct the representation. Then there is a horizon, so it represents the limits of the scale. And it's a very nice, I don't know whether everybody who saw the, the movie about Chernobyl, this five or four or five uh, piece uh, movie, I, I think it was done by BBC or something like that. And there it was funny because when the reactor blew up, so they were measuring radiation. And they came up with a value 3.7. And they were very happy because it's not dangerous, it's a safe, it's good, good value. But it was the limit of the measurement of the detector. So they were using small detectors and they could measure only till 3.7 Renger per hour. And so they all were happy that nothing happens. The real radiation was some thousands of Rengen. So, you know, but because we have the scale, we have the 3.7. I don't know whether you remember, but it's a beautiful movie and a very interesting, very funny scene. So they all are very happy that the radiation is not high and it's, it's very nice that they have only 3.7. So the horizon, the limits of the scale of measurements are also very important. And the third is identity relation. So if you have, for instance, a thermometer, you can determine that the shift from one to three degrees of Celsius, so really cold water you put in and put other, is the same as from 2023 to 2025. Now, I think nobody is able to make this comparison in a sensory 
perception. So basically on touching or feeling the temperature. But still, if you have a measurement equipment, it gives you the identity relations that this and these changes are identical. So I think these are the three things that a measurement equipment introduces into the world or into the phenomenon. It introduces the zero or the origin or the point of reference. It introduces some kind of horizon, how far the measurement can go, how far the scale reaches, and then identity relations. So basically, these are the structures that a stabilization of an epistemic contact brings into our experience. But of course, most interesting and most funny ways happen by extending of the epistemic contact. So I will speak about four cases where really something changed. The first was the Galileo and his study of free fall. I like this very much. So if you look, is it accelerated or not? I think nobody can see. So how the free fall is presented to our sensory experience, we have no idea whether it's accelerated or not. Of course, we know it because if you jump from a higher altitude, <laughs> you know, it's worse and worse. So basically, we somehow can deduce that the ch it somehow accelerates, but phenomenally, we don't see it. And now, uh, Gallo came with a very interesting idea of an inclined plane. What is a free fall? A free fall is a fall on a totally inclined plane. So he started to experiment with inclined plane, and this gives us a first understanding of experiment. So what is the experiment? Experiment creates an artificial phenomenon by means of which we study some other phenomenon. So something interests us, but we don't have access. We cannot somehow see it. We cannot distinguish. We cannot determine it. So what do we do? We create the inclined plane, play with the inclined plane for some time, and discover. So of course, in Gallo, it's very interesting because, for instance, he had to measure short times, short time, inter short time in intervals. And the best way how it can be done is by music. So he let somebody to play a guitar or some kind of instrument. And if you have a rapid song, so there you are uh, able to discriminate one fourth of a second. So really, if you have a, if you sing, have a song, and so you can, you, the eye, the ear is able to discriminate one fourth of a second. So really short time intervals. And he was able in this way by using music to do physics. So it was, in a sense, very interesting. So this is the first thing that we somehow extend. So even though we don't have access to the acceleration of the free fall, indirectly by inclined plane, we can make the, or discover the law. Of course, Newton is a other very interesting example. As I showed, the quantification of colors. So you can associate colors with the law, with the angle of refraction. Why is it fantastic? It's interesting because Galileo wrote that actually colors are secondary qualities. So according to Galileo, there is nothing like color. And if people would disappear, then color would dis colors, tastes, smells would disappear as well. So G Galileo was trying to say that you have two kinds of physical quantities, like distance or weight or speed. They are objective, and then there are things like colors and smells and tastes, which if there would be no people, there would be no tastes, no colors, no smells. And uh, if we go back to Newton, so surely there would be colors because, you know, you could dis discriminate the angles. You could discriminate where the light comes. So in a sense, Newton is changing the boundary between secondary and primary and secondary qualities. Of course, philosophers are quarreling about this until now, whether physics, physics, physics capture the real color or only something that correlates to it, etc. But it is not the point now. Then comes the thermometer. So of course, thermometer is a typical measurement equipment. So it has a zero, it has a scale, it has a unit. And again, it's interesting because Newton wanted to construct a thermometer because he did very good chemistry. Many people nowadays, it's fashionable to say that Newton was an alchemist, but I don't believe it. I believe that he was a good chemist. And actually, he wanted to do chemical experiments, 
but without a thermometer it's very difficult because the ter chemical experiments are very sensitive to temperature and so it's very difficult to repeat an experiment if you don't know at what temperature it was done. So the big, big Newton, so if he, was, he was one of the best experimental physicists ever and he was not able to construct a thermometer. So it was really a very important thing. But of course what Celsius did, he just gave us a better access to a phenomenon which we know. Everybody knows what is heat. So it's not, not so difficult, but of course he extended it to heats which we cannot perceive. But then comes Torricelli. Of course Torricelli is between Galileo and Newton historically, but the barometer is a strange thing because nobody knew that there is atmospheric pressure. So basically it was really introduced into our, our picture by this instrument. And of course, if you don't have thermometer and barometer, you cannot do thermodynamics. So, so the basic, so only the volume. So Greeks had volume, but they didn't have temperature, they didn't have pressure, so they, they couldn't do thermodynamics. So in a sense, we see that actually by building instruments, we get access to phenomena, and at the end, we are able to do real, real science, so describe equations, etc. But the instrumental practice of particular discipline, physical discipline, uses a number of instruments. And they provide contact to different aspects of reality on various directions, different ways of stabilization, different scales, different precision. So the data that we get are very, very complicated. And I believe that to prevent the fragmentation of instrumental practice, into a series of independent, incompatible, incommensurable practices. So everybody would measure his own set of quantities and people wouldn't be able to communicate. I think to overcome this, physics has an important tool, which is idealization. So basically, we present the outcomes of experiments, measurements, etc. in a mathematical language. That is what Galileo told us. And by this means, we are able to put them together. So uh, now we come to idealization. And uh, the idealization is somehow related to synthesis. So this is a Kantian strain. So I, if somebody doesn't like Kant, so maybe it should be done differently. But the basic idea is that how can we put things together? So Galileo discovered that by free fall, the distance, the spatium, is proportional to square of the time. But what is the square of the time? Has anybody perceived square of the time? How many square second has a square minute? And now how is it flowing? It is flowing so, or it is flowing diagonally, or so how is flowing the square of time? Does it exist? And the idea is that basically, we measure time, then plug it into mathematics, and mathematics give us cube, logarithm of time, sinus of time, so any, any mathematical function that you wish, and then we can relate these functions together. So basically the relational synthesis is done in a way that measurement gives you just poor time, poor distance, poor anything, and then everything else is mathematics. So mathematics connects quantities, into empirical laws. So that is the first point, which I call relational synthesis. So relational synthesis is basically done here by the language of algebra or by calculus or by any other mathematical tool. It creates you from a quantity many, many expressions, and so many more relations can be found. On, on a, the level of experience, you cannot perceive the proportionality between distance and square of time. Because you cannot dis uh, perceive square of time. Square of time is not something that you perceive. You perceive time and then form a square of it by mathematics. And by this means, so mathematics creates many expressions and you then plug, in, plug them in into formulas and get physical laws. So that is the first the relational synthesis. So you are relating different aspects of a phenomenon by means of mathematics, by means of mathematical language. The second is even more interesting, and is compositional synthesis. If you look on Aristotelian or even Galilean physics, what is surprising it is that there is only one body moving. What, what, what is Galileo famous for? Galileo is famous for 
falling body, then pendulum, then inclined plane, and the projectile motion. All of them, only one body is moving because they were not able to somehow connect different moving bodies into a dynamical system. So that is why I say that they lacked compositional synthesis. They were not able to compose motions into a system. And I invented it, so they had something like autistic physics. So basically, everybody is moving on its trajectory. Of course, they had composite systems, so the Ptolemaic system has many moving bodies, but each body is moving on its own, so it's ignoring all the other bodies, just like when small kids play soccer. Everybody runs after the ball, and they are not able to follow what the others are doing. And Newtonian physics is different in a sense that it creates uh, the state of the body, then from the state of individual bodies, it creates the composite state of the system, and by this means, it describes the motion of all the bodies in interaction, etc. So, Aristotelian physics, unlike Aristotelian, or Newtonian physics, unlike Aristotelian or Galilean, is able to compose motions. And I, I think it's very interesting because the Aristotelian logic has a very strange feature, which is called monadic quantification. So Aristotle has only one quantifier. All animals are mortal. He cannot say that for every child has a mother. So for every animal, there is a other animal that is his, but for his mother. This is something that is inexpressible in Aristotelian logic. So just like in logic, also in physics, in a sense, he's always following just one object. He's quantifying or one variable. He is looking for the motion of one body. And so the compositional synthesis in physics is the ability of the language to put together motions of different objects and create a dynamical system of many, many objects. And this was done by Newton. And the third is the deductive synthesis. So this is the famous Newton's law written by Euler. So basically, it's uh, because Euler was complaining that if you slightly change in any problem solved by Newton the uh, conditions, you cannot solve it because the geometry doesn't work. So it is the Newtonian system was very peculiar, peculiar because it was formulated in geometrical language. So Euler rewrote it into differential equation. So this is a first differential equation in the history of physics and mathematics, and it allows to deduce from the present state of the system its future states. And this I call deductive synthesis. So it somehow joins together, synthesizes the states of the system into one flow, into one dynamics, into one thing. And uh, these three kinds of synthesis com uh, correspond to three kinds of reduction. So now we are coming to the final point, and this is that actually what we do in physics, there is a phenomenal, I call it phenomenal reduction because it was somehow inspired by Husserl, so reduce every phenomenon to a mathematical quantity. So for instance, reduce color to wavelength, reduce temperature, so heat to temp, etc. So really measure. If you can do this, then you get as a bonus the relational synthesis because you can relate these numbers by means of algebra, calculus, etc. So many more opportunities appear to you than pure philosophers or ordinary people have. The second is ontological reduction, so reduce the representation of a body to its state. Because what is the state? So it's a very interesting thing. Uh, I was told it by Professor Pazman, who was teaching his statistics, that actually state is a way how you can get rid of your past. Because, you know, the state represents everything you need to predict the, predict the future, and you can cut away what happened. How, how you came into the state is not interesting. You are in the state, and you can do what will go on. So again, it's a reduction. It's a reduction of the complex information about the system into state variables, etc. And what you get, you get compositional system synthesis. If you have states, you can compose them into the total the dynamics. And then the third is the causal reduction. And it, is, it was done by Newton that every interaction is action of forces. That was Newton's basic program, basic idea, that if something interacts with something, you have to have some action of force, some impulse or something. And if you do this, you can plug the forces into the differential equation, and you can calculate the future. So basically, uh, 
This is, I think, how the language of physics works. So, of course, this phenomenal reduction is done by instruments, is done by measurement, etc. So, that is how we came here, but here is the, the top. So, how any, if you look on any physical theory, so electrodynamics, you have fields and you have Maxwell equations. In quantum mechanics, you have, again, psi function and the Schrodinger equation, etc. So, you know it much better than me that basically this scheme works. And why is this scheme there? It is there to unify all the instruments. So, everything that you measure, everything that you know, everything, every information, you can somehow plug into this structure. And so, you can get a representation of the world. And the last slide. Thank you for your attention.